Orpheus in the Underworld and Orpheus in Hell are English names for Orfeo and Furs, a comic opera with music by Jacques Offenbach and words by Hector Cremieux and Ludovic Halevi. It was first performed as a two-act opera bouffon at the Théâtre des Bouffes Parisiens, Paris, on 21 October 1858, and was extensively revised and expanded in a four-act Opera Fieri version, presented at the Theatre de la Gate, Paris, on 7 February 1874. The opera is a lampoon of the ancient legend of Orpheus and Eurydice. In this version, Orpheus is not the son of Apollo but a rustic violin teacher. He is glad to be rid of his wife, Eurydice, when she is abducted by the god of the underworld. Orpheus has to be bullied by public opinion into trying to rescue Eurydice. The reprehensible conduct of the gods of Olympus in the opera was widely seen as a veiled satire of the court and government of Napoleon III, Emperor of the French. Some critics expressed outrage at the librettist's disrespect for classic mythology and the composer's parody of Gluck's opera Orfeo ed Eurydice, others praised the piece highly. Orfeo in Furs was Offenbach's first full-length opera. The original 1858 production became a box office success, and ran well into the following year, rescuing Offenbach and his Booth's company from financial difficulty. The 1874 revival broke records at the Geitz box office. The work was frequently staged in France and internationally during the composer's lifetime and throughout the 20th century. It is his most often performed opera and continues to be revived in the 21st century. In the last decade of the 19th century the Paris cabarets the Moulin Rouge and Folies Bergère adopted the music of the «Gallop Infernal» from the culminating scene of the opera to accompany the can-can, and ever since then the tune has been popularly associated with the dance. Topic. Background and first productions Between 1855 and 1858 Offenbach presented more than two dozen one-act operettas, first at the Bouffes Parisiens, Salle Le Cays, and then at the Bouffes Parisiens, Salle Chasseurle. The theatrical licensing laws then permitted him only four singers in any piece, and with such small casts, full-length works were out of the question. In 1858 the licensing restrictions were relaxed, and Offenbach was free to go ahead with a two-act work that had been in his mind for some time. Two years earlier he had told his friend the writer Hector Cremieux that, when he was musical director of the comedy Française in the early 1850s, he swore revenge for the boredom he suffered from the posturings of mythical heroes and gods of Olympus in the plays presented there. Cremieux and Ludovic Halevi sketched out a libretto for him lampooning such characters. By 1858, when Offenbach was finally allowed a large enough cast to do the theme justice, Halevi was preoccupied with his work as a senior civil servant, and the final libretto was credited to Cremieux alone. Most of the roles were written with popular members of the Booth's company in mind, including Desire, Léon Kay, Lise Torton, and Henry Tai as an Orphée who could actually play Orpheus's violin. The first performance took place at the Salle Chasseur on 21 October 1858. At first the piece did reasonably well at the box office but was not the tremendous success Offenbach had hoped for. He insisted on lavish stagings for his operas, expenses were apt to outrun receipts, and he was in need of a substantial money spinner. Business received an inadvertent boost from the critic Jules Janin of the journal Des Debats. 
He had praised earlier productions at the Bouffes Parisians but was roused to vehement indignation at what he maintained was a blasphemous, lascivious outrage, a profanation of holy and glorious antiquity. His attack, and the irreverent public reposts by Cremieux and Offenbach, made headlines and provoked huge interest in the piece among the Parisian public, who flocked to see it. In his 1980 study of Offenbach, Alexander Farris writes, Orphe became not only a triumph, but a cult. It ran for 228 performances, at a time when a run of 100 nights was considered a success. Albert LaSalle, in his History of the Bouffes Parisians 1860, wrote that the piece closed in June 1859 although it was still performing strongly at the box office, "...because the actors, who could not tire the public, were themselves exhausted." In 1874 Offenbach substantially expanded the piece, doubling the length of the score and turning the intimate opera Buffon of 1858 into a four-act opera theory extravaganza, with substantial ballet sequences. This version opened at the Théâtre de la Gate on 7 February 1874 and broke box office records for that theatre. During the first run of the revised version Offenbach expanded it even further, adding ballets illustrating the Kingdom of Neptune in Act Three and bringing the total number of scenes in the four acts to 22. <laughs> <laughs> Roles Synopsis Topic Original two act version Topic Act One Scene One The Countryside near Thebes, Ancient Greece A spoken introduction with orchestral accompaniment introduction and melodrame opens the work. Public opinion explains who she is, the guardian of morality. Qui suis-je? Du théâtre antique. She says that unlike the chorus in ancient Greek plays she does not merely comment on the action, but intervenes in it, to make sure the story maintains a high moral tone. Her efforts are hampered by the facts of the matter. Orphe is not the son of Apollo, as in classical myth, but a rustic teacher of music, whose dislike of his wife, Eurydice, is heartily reciprocated. She is in love with the shepherd, Aristi, Aristeus, who lives next door. La femme don't le cœur rive, and Orphe is in love with Chloe, a shepherdess. When Orphe mistakes Eurydice for her, everything comes out, and Eurydice insists they abandon the marriage. Orphe, fearing public opinion's reaction, torments his wife into keeping the scandal quiet using violin music, which she hates. Ah, say Ainsy. Aristi enters. Though seemingly a shepherd, he is in reality Pluton, Pluto, god of the underworld. He keeps up his disguise by singing a pastoral song about sheep. Moi, je suis Aristi. Eurydice has discovered what she thinks is a plot by Orphe to kill Aristi, letting snakes loose in the fields, but is in fact a conspiracy between Orphe and Pluton to kill her, so that Pluton may have her and Orphe be rid of her. Pluton tricks her into walking into the trap by showing immunity to it, and she is bitten. As she dies, Pluton transforms into his true form transformation scene. Eurydice finds that death is not so bad when the god of death is in love with one. La mort m'apparate sourante. 
They descend into the underworld as soon as Eurydice has left a note telling her husband she has been unavoidably detained. All seems to be going well for Orphee until public opinion catches up with him, and threatens to ruin his violin teaching career unless he goes to rescue his wife. Orphee reluctantly agrees. Topic. Act 1, Scene 2, Olympus The scene changes to Olympus, where the gods are sleeping. Dormans, Dormans. Cupidon and Venus enter separately from amatory nocturnal escapades and join their sleeping colleagues, but everyone is soon woken by the sound of the Horn of Diane, supposedly chaste huntress and goddess. She laments the sudden absence of Actaeon, her current love, Quan Diane descend dans la plaine. To her indignation, Jupiter tells her he has turned Actaeon into a stag to protect her reputation. Mercury arrives and reports that he has visited the underworld, to which Pluton has just returned with a beautiful woman. Pluton enters, and is taken to task by Jupiter for his scandalous private life. To Pluton's relief the other gods choose this moment to revolt against Jupiter's reign, their boring diet of ambrosia and nectar, and the sheer tedium of Olympus. O arms, dieu et demi dieu. Jupiter's demands to know what is going on led them to point out his hypocrisy in detail, poking fun at all his mythological affairs. Poor Sedur Alcmean la fière. Orphe's arrival, with public opinion at his side, has the gods on their best behavior. Il approche. Il savants. Orphe obeys public opinion and pretends to be pining for Eurydice. He illustrates his supposed pain with a snatch of Che Ferro Senza Eurydice from Gluck's Orfeo. Pluton is worried he will be forced to give Eurydice back. Jupiter announces that he is going to the underworld to sort everything out. The other gods beg to come with him, he consents, and mass celebrations break out at this holiday. Gloire, gloire à Jupiter. Partons, partons. Topic: <laughs> Act 2, Scene 1, Pluton's boudoir in the underworld. Eurydice is being kept locked up by Pluton, and is finding life very tedious. Her jailer is a dull-witted tippler by the name of John Styx. Before he died, he was king of Boeotia a region of Greece that Aristophanes made synonymous with country bumpkins, and he sings Eurydice a doleful lament for his lost kingship. Quan jatai's roi de Boeotia. Jupiter discovers where Pluton has hidden Eurydice, and slips through the keyhole by turning into a beautiful, golden fly. He meets Eurydice on the other side, and sings a love duet with her where his part consists entirely of buzzing. Duo de la mouche. Afterwards, he reveals himself to her, and promises to help her, largely because he wants her for himself. Pluton is left furiously berating John Styx. Topic: <laughs> Act 2, Scene 2, The Banks of the Styx. The scene shifts to a huge party the gods are having, where ambrosia, nectar, and propriety are nowhere to be seen. Vive la vin. Vive Pluton. Eurydice is present, disguised as a Bacchante, Jai Vula Dieu Bacchus. But Jupiter's plan to sneak her out is interrupted by calls for a dance. Jupiter insists on a minuet, which everybody else finds boring. La la la. Le menuet en a vraiment si charmant. Things liven up as the most famous number in the opera, the Gallop Infernal, 
begins, and all present throw themselves into it with wild abandon. C.E. Bal est original. Ominous violin music heralds the approach of Orphe, entrance of Orphe and public opinion, but Jupiter has a plan, and promises to keep Eurydice away from her husband. As with the standard myth, Orphe must not look back, or he will lose Eurydice forever. Ni regard par en arrière. Public opinion keeps a close eye on him, to keep him from cheating, but Jupiter throws a lightning bolt, making him jump and look back, Eurydice vanishes. Amid the ensuing turmoil, Jupiter proclaims that she will henceforth belong to the god Bacchus and become one of his priestesses. Public opinion is not pleased, but Pluton has had enough of Eurydice, Orphe is free of her, and all ends happily. <laughs> Revised 1874 version The plot is essentially that of the 1858 version. Instead of two acts with two scenes apiece, the later version is in four acts, which follow the plot of the four scenes of the original. The revised version differs from the first in having several interpolated ballet sequences, and some extra characters and musical numbers. The additions do not affect the main narrative but add considerably to the length of the score. In Act I there is an opening chorus for assembled shepherds and shepherdesses, and Orpheus has a group of youthful violin students, who bid him farewell at the end of the act. In Act II Mercure is given a solo entrance number, A Hop. In Act III, Eurydice has a new solo, the Couplets des Regrets, a Kel Triste Destiné. Cupidon has a new number, the Couplets des Bases, Allen's, M.E.S. Finn's Limiers. The three judges of Hades and a little band of policemen are added to the cast to be involved in Jupiter's search for the concealed Eurydice, and at the end of the act, the furious Pluton is seized and carried off by a swarm of flies. Topic. Music The score of the opera, which formed the pattern for the many full-length Offenbach operas that followed, is described by Farris as having an "...abundance of couplets", songs with repeated verses for one or more singers a variety of other solos and duets, several big choruses, and two extended finales. Offenbach wrote in a variety of styles, from Rococo pastoral vein, via pastiche of Italian opera, to the uproarious gallop, displaying, in Farris's analysis, many of his personal hallmarks, such as melodies that leap backwards and forwards in a remarkably acrobatic manner while still sounding not only smoothly lyrical, but spontaneous as well. In such up tempo numbers as the Gallop Infernal, Offenbach makes a virtue of simplicity, often keeping to the same key through most of the number, with largely unvarying instrumentation throughout. Elsewhere in the score, Offenbach gives the orchestra greater prominence. In the Duo de la Mouche, Jupiter's part, consisting of buzzing like a fly, is accompanied by the first and second violins playing sul ponticello, to produce a similarly buzzing sound. In Le Figaro, Gustave Lafargue remarked that Offenbach's use of a piccolo trill punctuated by a tap on a cymbal in the finale of the first scene was a modern recreation of an effect invented by Gluck in his score of Iphigenie en Orlide. Wilfred Mellers also remarks on Offenbach's use of the piccolo to enhance Euidice's couplets with «girlish giggles» on the instrument. Gervais Hughes comments on the elaborate scoring of the «Ballet des Mouches» 
Act III, 1874 version, and calls it a tour de force that could have inspired Tchaikovsky. Farris comments that in Orfeo infers Offenbach shows that he was a master of establishing mood by the use of rhythmic figures. Farris instances three numbers from the second act 1858 version, which all are in the key of a major and use identical notes in almost the same order but it would be hard to imagine a more extreme difference in feeling than that between the song of the King of the Boeotians and the Gallop." In a 2014 study Heather Hadlock comments that for the former, Offenbach composed, "...a languid yet restless melody." Over a static musette style drone bass accompaniment of alternating dominant and tonic harmonies, simultaneously evoking and mocking nostalgia for a lost place and time and creating a perpetually unresolved tension between pathos and irony. Mellers finds that Styx's aria has a pathos that touches the heart. Perhaps, he suggests, the only instance of true feeling in the opera. In 1999, Thomas Shippages wrote in the International Journal of Musicology that many scholars hold that Offenbach's music defies all musicological methods. He did not agree, and analyzed the Gallop Infernal, finding it to be sophisticated in many details. For all its straightforwardness, it reveals a calculated design. The overall economy of the piece serves a deliberate musical dramaturgy." Hadlock observes that although the best known music in the opera is "...driven by the propulsive energies of Racinian comedy." and the up-tempo gallop, such lively numbers go side by side with statelier music in an 18th-century vein. The score's sophistication results from Offenbach's intertwining of contemporary urban musical language with a restrained and wistful tone that is undermined and ionized without ever being entirely undone. Orfeo Infers was the first of Offenbach's major works to have a chorus. In a 2017 study Melissa Cummins comments that although the composer used the chorus extensively as Pluton's minions, bored residents of Olympus, and Bacantes in Hades, they are merely there to fill out the vocal parts in the large ensemble numbers, and are treated as a nameless, faceless crowd who just happen to be around." In the Olympus scene the chorus has an unusual Boca Chusa section, marked, Bouche Fermi, an effect later used by Bizet in Jamile and Pacini in the Humming Chorus in Madama Butterfly. Editions. <laughs> 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 The orchestra at the Bouffes Parisians was small, probably about 30 players. The 1858 version of Orfeo in Furs is scored for two flutes the second doubling piccolo, one oboe, two clarinets, one bassoon, two horns, two cornets, one trombone, timpani, percussion bass drum, cymbals, triangle, and strings. The Offenbach scholar Jean Christoph Keck speculates that the string sections consisted of at most six first violins, four second violins, three violas, four cellos, and one double bass. The 1874 score calls for considerably greater orchestral forces. Offenbach added additional parts for woodwind, brass, and percussion sections. For the premiere of the revised version he engaged an orchestra of 60 players, as well as a military band of a further 40 players for the procession of the gods from Olympus at the end of the second act. The music of the 1874 revision was well received by contemporary reviewers, but some later critics have felt the longer score, with its extended ballet sections, has occasional dull patches. Nonetheless, some of the added numbers Numbers, particularly Cupidon's 
Couplets des Bases, Mercure's Rondo, A Hop, and the Policeman's Chorus have gained favor, and some or all are often added to performances otherwise using the 1858 text. For more than a century after the composer's death, one cause of critical reservations about this and the his other works was the persistence of what the musicologist Nigel Simeone has called botched, butchered, and balderized versions. Since the beginning of the 21st century a project has been underway to release scholarly and reliable scores of Offenbach's operas, under the editorship of Keck. The first to be published, in 2002, was the 1858 version of Orfeo and Furs. The Offenbach edition Keck has subsequently published the 1874 score, and another drawing on both the 1858 and 1874 versions. <laughs> Overture and Gallop The best known and much recorded Orfeo in Furs Overture is not by Offenbach, and is not part of either the 1858 or the 1874 scores. It was arranged by the Austrian musician Karl Binder for the first production of the opera in Vienna, in 1860. Offenbach's 1858 score has a short orchestral introduction of 104 bars, it begins with a quiet melody for woodwind, followed by the theme of Jupiter's Act II minuet, in A flat major and segues via a mock pompous fugue in F major into public opinion's opening monologue. The overture to the 1874 revision is a 393-bar piece, in which Jupiter's minuet and John Styx's song recur, interspersed with many themes from the score including, "'Jai vu le dieu Bacchus'", the couplets, "'Je suis Venus'", the rondo des metamorphoses, the "'Partons, Partons'", section of the Act II finale, and the Act IV gallop, fifteen years or so after Offenbach's death the gallop from Act II or Act IV in the 1874 version became one of the world's most famous pieces of music, when the Moulin Rouge and the Folies Bergère adopted it as the regular music for their can-can. Keck has commented that the original, "'Infernal Gallop was a considerably more spontaneous and riotous affair than the fin de siècle can can Keck likens the original to a modern rave but the tune is now inseparable in the public mind from high-kicking female can can dancers. <laughs> Numbers Topic Reception Topic Nineteenth Century From the outset Orfeo in Furs divided critical opinion. Janin's furious condemnation did the work much more good than harm, and was in contrast with the laudatory review of the premiere by Jules Noriak in the Figaro programme, which called the work, "...unprecedented, splendid, outrageous, gracious, delightful, witty, amusing, successful, perfect, tuneful." Bertrand Jouvin, in Le Figaro, criticized some of the cast but praised the staging, "...a fantasy show, which has all the variety, all the surprises of fairy opera." The Revue et Gazette Musicale de Paris thought that though it would be wrong to expect too much in a piece of this genre, Orfeo en Furs was one of Offenbach's most outstanding works, with charming couplets for Eurydice, Aristi Pluton and the King of Boeotia. Le Menestrel called the cast, "...thoroughbreds", who did full justice to 
all the charming jokes, all the delicious originalities, all the farcical oddities thrown in profusion into Offenbach's music. Writing of the 1874 revised version, the authors of Les Annales du Theatre et de la Musique said, Orfeo in Furs is above all a good show. The music of Offenbach has retained its youth and spirit. The amusing operetta of yore has become a splendid extravaganza, against which Felix Clement and Pierre Larousse wrote in their Dictionnaire des Opéras 1881 that the piece is a coarse and grotesque parody, full of vulgar and indecent scenes that give off an unhealthy smell. The opera was widely seen as containing thinly disguised satire of the regime of Napoleon III, but the early press criticisms of the work focused on its mockery of revered classical authors such as Ovid and the equally sacrosanct music of Gluck's Orfeo. Farris comments that the satire perpetrated by Offenbach and his librettists was cheeky rather than hard-hitting, and Richard Taruskin in his study of 19th-century music observes, "...the calculated licentiousness and feigned sacrilege, which successfully baited the stuffier critics, were recognized by all for what they were, a social palliative, the very opposite of social criticism." The spectacle of the Olympian gods doing the Kang Kan threatened nobody's dignity. The emperor greatly enjoyed Orfeo in Furs when he saw it at a command performance in 1860. He told Offenbach he would never forget that dazzling evening. Topic: 20th and 21st centuries. After Offenbach's death his reputation in France suffered a temporary eclipse. In Farris's words, his comic operas were "...dismissed as irrelevant and meretricious souvenirs of a discredited empire." Obituarists in other countries similarly took it for granted that the comic operas, including Orphée, were ephemeral and would be forgotten. By the time of the composer's centenary, in 1919, it had been clear for some years that such predictions had been wrong. Orphe was frequently revived, as were several more of his operas, and criticisms on moral or musical grounds had largely ceased. Gabriel Groves wrote in the musical Quarterly, the libretto of Orphe overflows with spirit and humor and the score is full of sparkling wit and melodious charm. It is impossible to analyze adequately a piece wherein the sublimest idiocy and the most astonishing fancy clash at every turn. Offenbach never produced a more complete work. Among modern critics, Traubner describes Orphe as the first great full-length classical French operetta classical in both senses of the term although he regards the 1874 revision as overblown Peter Gammond writes that the public appreciated the frivolity of the work while recognizing that it is rooted in the best traditions of opera comique among 21st century writers, Bernard Holland has commented that the music is beautifully made, relentlessly cheerful, reluctantly serious, but does not show as the later tales of Hoffmann does what a profoundly gifted composer Offenbach really was. Andrew Lamb has commented that although Orfeo in Furs has remained Offenbach's best known work. A consensus as to the best of his operettas would probably prefer La Vie Parisienne for its sparkle, La Péricole for its charm and La Belle Helen for its all-round brilliance." Kurt Ganzel writes in the Encyclopedia of the Musical Theatre that compared with earlier efforts, Orfeo in Furs was, "...something on a different scale." 
a gloriously imaginative parody of classic mythology and of modern events decorated with often Bach's most laughing boof music. In a 2014 study of parody and burlesque in Orfeo in Furs, Hadlock writes, with Orfeo in Furs, the genre we now know as operetta gathered its forces and leapt forward, while still retaining the quick, concise style of its one-act predecessors, their absurdist and risque sensibility, and their economy in creating maximum comic impact with limited resources. At the same time, it reflects Offenbach's desire to establish himself and his company as legitimate heirs of the 18th-century French comic tradition of Philidor and Gretry. Revivals <inaudible> 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 Between the first run and the first Paris revival, in 1860, the Bouffes Parisians Company toured the French provinces, where Orfeo in Furs was reported as meeting with immense and incredible success. Torton was succeeded as Eurydice by Delphine Ugald when the production was revived at the Bouffes Parisians in 1862 and again in 1867. The first revival of the 1874 version was at the Theatre de la Gate in 1875 with Marie Blanche Pescud as Eurydice. It was revived again there in January 1878 with Mayronet Orphie, Eurydice, Christian Jupiter, Habe Pluton, and Pierre Grivet as both Mercure and John Styx. For the Exposition Universal season later that year, Offenbach revived the piece again, with Grivet as Orphie, Pescud as Eurydice, the composer's old friend and rival Herve as Jupiter and Leonke as Pluton. The opera was seen again at the gate in 1887 with Taufenberger or Fee, Jean Granier Eurydice, Eugene Vorthia Jupiter, and Alexandra Pluton. There was a revival at the Eden Theatre 1889 with Minot, Granier, Christian and Alexandra. 20th century revivals in Paris included productions at the Théâtre des Varieties 1902 with Charles Prince or Fee, Juliette Mealy, Eurydice, Guy, Jupiter and Albert Brasseur, Pluton and in 1912 with Paul Borillon, Mealy, Guy and Prince, the Théâtre Mogador 19 1931 with Adrian Lamy, Mance Bojan, Max Dealey and Lucien Murator, the opera comic 1970 with Remy Carraza, Anne-Marie Sagnol, Michel Roux and Robert Andreozzi, the Théâtre de la Gate Lyrique 1972 with Jean Giraudot, Jean Brune, Albert Voli and Sagnol, and by the Théâtre Français de l'Operette at the Espèce Cardin 1984 with multiple casts including in alphabetical order André Dran, Martin Koningsberger, Martine March, Martine Maskelin, Marcel Quillevere, Ghislaine Raffinelle, Bernard Sinclair and Michel Trempont. In January 1988 the work received its first performances at the Paris Opera, with Michel Senecal Danielle Borst Eurydice, François Le Roux Jupiter, and Laurence Dale Pluton. .In December 1997 a production by Laurent Pelly was seen at the Opera National de Lyon, where it was filmed for DVD, with Yann Buron Orphie, Nathalie Dessay Eurydice, Laurent Nour Jupiter, and Jean-Paul Fouchecourt Pluton with Mark Minkowski conducting. The production originated in Geneva, where it had been given in September, in a former hydroelectric plant used while the stage area of the Grand Theatre was being renovated, by a cast headed by Buron, Anik Massis, Nuri, and Eric Hutchett. Topic: Continental Europe. 
The first production outside France is believed to have been at Breslau in October 1859. In December of the same year the opera opened in Prague. The work was given in German at the Karl Theater, Vienna, in March 1860 in a version by Ludwig Kalisch, revised and embellished by Johann Nestroy, who played Jupiter. Making fun of Greco-Roman mythology had a long tradition in the popular theatre of Vienna, and audiences had no difficulty with the disrespect that had outraged Jules Janin and others in Paris. It was for this production that Karl Binder put together the version of the overture that is now the best known. There were revivals at the same theatre in February and June 1861 both given in French and at the Theatre and Dare Wien in January 1867. 1860 saw the work's local premieres in Brussels, Stockholm, Copenhagen and Berlin. Productions followed in Warsaw, St. Petersburg, and Budapest, and then Zurich, Madrid, Amsterdam, Milan and Naples. Ganzel mentions among countless other productions a large and glitzy German revival under Max Reinhardt at the Groß Schauspielhaus, Berlin in 1922. A more recent Berlin production was directed by Gotz Friedrich in 1983. A video of the production was released. 2019 productions include those directed by Helmut Baumann at the Vienna Volksoper, and by Barry Kosky at the Haus für Mozart, Salzburg, with a cast headed by Anne Sophie von Otter as L'Opinion Public, a co production between the Salzburg Festival, Komische Oper Berlin, and Deutsche Oper am Rhein. Britain The first London production of the work was at Her Majesty's Theatre in December 1865, in an English version by J. R. Planch titled Orpheus in the Haymarket. There were West End productions in the original French in 1869 and 1870 by companies headed by Hortense Schneider. English versions followed by Alfred Thompson 1876 and Henry S. Lee 1877. An adaptation by Herbert Beerbohm Tree and Alfred Noyes opened at His Majesty's in 1911. The opera was not seen again in London until 1960, when a new adaptation by Geoffrey Dunn opened at Sadler's Wells Theatre. This production was frequently revived between 1960 and 1974. An English version by Snoo Wilson for English National Opera Eno, mounted at the London Coliseum in 1985, was revived there in 1987. A co-production by Opera North and the Doily Cart Opera Company in a version by Jeremy Sams opened in 1992 and was revived several times. In 2019 Eno announced a new production with an English text by Tom Morris. <laughs> Outside Europe The first New York production was at the Stadt Theater, in German, in March 1861. The production ran until February 1862. Two more productions were sung in German, December 1863 with Fritzer, Knorr, Klein and Frin von Hedemann and December 1866 with Brugmann, Knorr, Klein and Frin Steglich Fuchs. The opera was produced at the Théâtre Français in January 1867 with Elvira Nadi, and at the Fifth Avenue Theatre in April 1868 with Lucille Tosti. In December 1883 it was produced at the Bijou Theatre with Max Freeman, Marie Vanoni, Digby Bell and Harry Pepper. 
There were productions in Rio de Janeiro in 1865, Buenos Aires in 1866, Mexico City in 1867 and Valparaiso in 1868. The opera was first staged in Australia at the Princess Theatre, Melbourne in March 1872, in Planche's London text, with Alice May as Eurydice. A spectacular production by Reinhardt was presented in New York in 1926. The New York City Opera staged the work, conducted by Eric Lensdorf, in 1956, with Sylvia Stahlman as Eurydice and Norman Kelly as Pluto. More recent U.S. productions have included a 1985 version by Santa Fe Opera, and the 1985 Eno version, which was staged in the U.S. by the Houston Grand Opera in 1986, and Los Angeles Opera in 1989. 21st century worldwide In April 2019 the OperaBase website recorded 25 past or scheduled productions of the opera from 2016 onwards, in French or in translation, 9 in Germany, 4 in France, 2 in Britain, 2 in Switzerland, 2 in the US, and productions in Gdansk, Liege, Ljubljana, Malmö, Prague and Tokyo. Topic Recordings Topic Audio Topic In French There are three full length recordings. The first, from 1951 features the Paris Philharmonic Chorus and Orchestra, conducted by René Leibowitz, with Jean Moline or Fee, Claudine Collet Eurydice, Bernard Demini Jupiter, and André Dran Pluton. it uses the 1858 version. A 1978 issue from Emmy employs the expanded 1874 version, it features the chorus and orchestra of the Toulouse capital conducted by Michel Plasson, with Michel Senecal or Fee, Mady Mespel Eurydice, Michel Trempont Jupiter, and Charles Burles Pluton. A 1999 recording of the 1858 score with some additions from the 1874 revision features the chorus and orchestra of the Opera National de Lyon, conducted by Marc Minkowski, with Jan Buron or Fee, Nathalie Dessay Eurydice, Laurent Nouri Jupiter, and Jean-Paul Fouchecourt Pluton. In English As at 2019 the only recording of the full work made in English is the 1995 Doily Cart production, conducted by John Owen Edwards with David Fieldsend Orpheus, Mary Hegarty Eurydice, Richard Suart Jupiter, and Barry Patterson Pluto. It uses the 1858 score with some additions from the 1874 revision. The English text is by Jeremy Sams. Extended excerpts were recorded of two earlier productions, Sadler's Wells 1960, conducted by Alexander Farris, with June Bronhill as Eurydice and Eric Schilling as Jupiter, and English National Opera 1985, conducted by Mark Elder, with Stuart Cale Orpheus, Lillian Watson Eurydice, Richard Angus Jupiter, and Emile Belcourt Pluto. Topic in German. There have been three full-length recordings in German. 
The first, recorded in 1958, features the North German Radio Symphony Orchestra and Chorus conducted by Paul Burkhard, with Heinz Hopper Orpheus, Anneliese Rothenberger as Eurydice Eurydike, Max Hansen as Jupiter and Ferry Gruber as Pluto. Rothenberger repeated her role in a 1978 Emmy set, with the Philharmonia Hungarica and Cologne Opera Chorus conducted by Willy Matz, with Adolf Orpheus, Benno Kuscher and Gruber Pluto. A recording based on the 1983 Berlin production by Gotz Friedrich features the orchestra and chorus of Deutsche Oper Berlin, conducted by Jesus Lopez Cobos, with Donald Grobe Orpheus, Julia Magines Eurydike, Hans Beira Jupiter, and George Shirley Pluto. <laughs> Topic. Video. Recordings have been released on DVD based on Herbert Wernicke's 1997 production at the Théâtre de la Monnaie, Brussels, with Alexandru Badia Orpheus, Elizabeth Vidal Eurydice, Dale Dusing Jupiter, and Reynaldo Marcius Pluton, and Laurent Pelli's production from the same year, with Natalie Dessay Eurydice, Jan Buron Orphe, Laurent Nouri Jupiter, and Jean-Paul Fouchko Pluton. A version in English made for the BBC in 1983 has been issued on DVD. It is conducted by Farris and features Alexander Oliver Orpheus, Lillian Watson Eurydice, Dennis Quilly Jupiter, and Emile Belcourt Pluto. The Berlin production by Friedrich was filmed in 1984 and has been released as a DVD. Topic Notes, References and Sources Equals 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 Notes <laughs>